Hello, my name is Sam Felton, the Director of the Public Health Collaboration, and welcome to our 2021 virtual conference. It's been a difficult year to say the least, but I just wanted to start off by saying thank you to all of our ambassadors, members, patrons, and scientific advisory board members for all of your support through these difficult times. Without you, we would never be able to continue to better inform the public about the power of lifestyle to help create a better world. Now, before I let the next presenter speak, this conference is 100% free for all forever. However, if you find the content here today valuable, uh, then please consider a £2 donation or whatever you can afford via www.phcuk.org forward slash donate or if you're in the UK, you can simply text PHC to 70660 to donate £2 directly from your phone. And of course, texts are charged at your standard network rate. We hope you enjoy the conference from wherever you are in the world and be sure to get involved in the civil conversation here on YouTube or by using the hashtag PHC vcon 2021 on facebook instagram and twitter thanks for your support and be well hello uh, my name is susan fairley and in this brief presentation i'd like to share some of my thoughts with you about ways we can improve the odds of getting the low carb message out to others I'm a retired chief nurse and now spend most of my time supporting NHS organisations, particularly in primary care with quality improvement and the human dimensions of leading change. I'll say more about my personal story later, but essentially I'm keen to support the public health collaboration. And in this small way, I'm hoping to make a contribution. Um, perhaps it'll help with our thinking about leading large scale change. Uh, on this next slide, um, you can see, if you look closely, you'll see the sunset on the horizon. And, and that's a bit, of a bit of a fun way of actually trying to say, if you want, if this is where you want to get to, we need to break away from this path that you can see, the tried and tested path. Um, if we keep going around, we're going to keep getting the same old results, keep going around the same path. So it's hard to commit to a scary new path that questions the usual ways. It's hard to stand against tradition. There's always opposition from the system and the people within it who don't want change to happen. Those who like the comfort of tradition. But if we don't try new things, we will continue to miss opportunities and we won't get to see that sunset. And so... On this next slide, you can see uh, some global research that was undertaken by McKinsey in 2008, which identified that 70% of change problems fail, largely due to the lack of attention to the human dimensions of change. And of the 30% that are successful, 70% of those aren't sustained. So when we're thinking about mobilizing individuals and groups towards a vision of a new future state, we need to consider a raft of interventions and aligning it with culture to identify how we want things to be done around here. And so with this in mind, um, back in about 2012, a number of us in the, in the QI space got together to help create the change model. And this drew on global best practice regarding sustainable change. And this is version two, which was adapted to include the care sector because they wanted to be involved as well. And you'll see that there are eight components, all of which are equally important. And if we pay attention to all eight, we reduce our potential blind spots and start a greater chance of the change being successful. And today I'd like to draw your attention to a few of the key enablers to help the social movement we are hoping to create. I can just move the next slide on. Um, so this is uh, my way of just bringing it to, to your attention, uh, the fact that all eight components are equally important and we tend to advocate starting with our shared purpose. Um, if we've got clarity about what we're trying to achieve and why we're trying to achieve it and who needs to be involved, we stand a greater chance of bringing other people with us on our journey. I've highlighted some of the areas as an example of how this can be brought to life. So for example, having data is such a powerful way to convince others. And whether that's the number of patients who reverse their type two diabetes, lost weight, or are no longer 
hypertensive, or even perhaps using David Unwin's sugar infographic can be so powerful when people can see what they thought was a healthy diet is actually laden with sugar. When we consider things like system drivers, just moving round to the side, we can actually see that um, we, system drives are typically things like national guidelines, how we get paid, things like COF. Those would be our normal system drivers. But our biggest current system driver is COVID. And so we can actually use this to strike while the iron is hot. And in part, thanks to Boris, there is growing interest now in the low carb movement to help reduce obesity, which we know is a known risk factor for COVID. Then moving back around, um, how we engage others to support change require, requires some skills around storytelling. And how can we create a compelling narrative so that we can all lead and all influence irrespective of hierarchy? This is not about position power. And thus together we can create the social movement to help ensure wider spread and adoption. So in this next slide, uh, if I can move it, um, you can see, I won't really expect you to read it all, but basically what this slide is saying is that you can seldom lead, Scott, lead, Scott, lead large scale change on your own. We need to apply social science research to motivate others to join us. It requires us to be an enabler and involves connecting different people and organizations, usually over whom we have no authority. So it's really worth trying to find the key influences in your community to help you spread the word. Again, this is not about positional power, but about people who are good at networking and who are well connected. And so here we can see, I'll move it on. We can see um, the power that we've seen recently that fury and indignation can have on society, galvanizing people around the world to take action to create the Black Lives Matter movement. Such social movements typically begin with a wrong, a small group of people caring and daring to hope that they can create a movement for change. In a similar manner, Greta Thunberg has created much greater awareness of climate change and not just amongst the younger people. And we know that so-called so -called social influencers get paid huge amounts to promote products because they have a large reach. Some have millions of followers. But we can also create a desire for change by making it fun. The recent Jerusalem dance has gone viral. We've even seen the Irish Garda and Ryanair cabin crew taking part, as well as nuns and monks. And some of the, even my colleagues within the primary care faculty have been doing this. Um, during these difficult times, it was seen as a way of coming together virtually to lift our spirits. And it's really caught on in a similar way that the Ice Bucket Challenge did to help raise funds for motor neurone disease a few years ago. struggling to move my thing on there we go so i'd like to introduce you now to this is the influence model uh, which sets out um four ways of of um influencing other people it's taken from the psychology of change management uh, and it suggests that there are four reasons that or basic conditions that people have to have met before they will change their behavior i'll change my mindset and behavior if i've got a good reason to if i see the point of the change and i agree with it at least enough to give it a try and that could be sometimes for a charitable cause um, uh, i'll change my mindset and behavior if i have role models I can see colleagues or friends that I admire modeling that desired behavior. Or if I've actually got the systems, processes and structures or guidelines in our case um, to support the new behavior. And finally, I have to have the skills required for the change. So for example, I need to be taught those Jerusalem dance steps if I'm gonna take part in that dance. So putting all four of these conditions in place is part of a dynamic process that greatly improves the chances of bringing about lasting changes in the mindsets and behaviours of people um, to help us achieve sustained improvement. Uh, this is a, a quote that has been banded around by uh, many in the NHS, it attributed to Ed Shine, and I couldn't find the, the original source, so I contacted him directly and I said, Ed, can I please have Professor Shine? Sorry, please can I have your uh, uh, the source for this quote that we keep using? And he came back, so, dear Professor Fairley. Uh, actually, I don't think I've ever said it, but I wholeheartedly believe in it. So please continue to use it. But the essence of this is that when we choose for ourselves, we're far more committed to the outcome, almost by a factor of five to one. 
And so conventional approaches to change management often underestimate the impact, um, the energy needed to drive change outcomes. Um, if we've got a shared sense of ownership, we, we will be um, equally committed to creating the answer. And this is just a little bit of um, humor to make a salutary point. You know, if you can't believe what you're seeing, yes, that is an escalator leading to the gym. Uh, but the message here is that we can have a specific action plan to achieve our objectives. Uh, we also need to align these with the necessary shifts in mindsets and behaviors. And context can actually be crucial here. So, for example, imagine that you're at a football match. And it's the last second and your team score a goal to win. You're probably jumping up and down and high-fiving all those around you. But now imagine you're equally passionate about the opera. And that same evening, you go to an opera house. And as the opera reaches your favourite crescendo, do you really start jumping up and down like you did earlier? Probably not, because even though you're the same person, you'll modify your behaviour according to the context. And the social cues that we get from our environment are quite different and shape our mindset and behaviour about what is appropriate to do and not to do. So if we want to influence a certain behaviour, we need to align all four levers of the influence model and avoid a confusing context where some cues will say uh, football match and others will say opera. Um, and this uh, really is just a, to, to show you that there's a shift from having a compliance mindset to a commitment mindset. Um, I'm not going to read all of that out. This, this next slide basically brings this to life. So it's unlikely these days that the only reason that you ensure a child is strapped into a car is because you were going to get fined. Yet back in the 1970s, those of you that might remember, uh, we had the clunk click campaign and it basically required a compliance mindset, doing things because we have to or we've been told to or we'd get fined if we didn't. These days, we typically have a commitment mindset to seatbelts, doing the right things for the right reasons. Um, we're doing something because we want to do them. And this will typically result in people going beyond what is required. And we've particularly witnessed this in recent months as an army of volunteers have stepped forward to help out with the vaccination programme. So in short, a compliance mindset stems from having a shared purpose as to why something matters. And this quote on this slide sums it up beautifully. You know, change can't be achieved by a press, slogan, press release or a slogan or an announcement. To be effective, it requires an active, mindful participation of the people affected by the change. And this helps to ensure that they're invested in the outcome. So to do this, change management thinking extols the virtues of creating a compelling change story. However, there are some inconvenient truths related to this, and I'll say some more about this later. But essentially, this means that what motivates you doesn't necessarily motivate others. And I'd like to introduce you to Marshall Gans, who um, was responsible for Barack Obama's um, speeches. And he's developed a narrative framework which helps us better understand how social change happens and to empower people to lead that change. I'll say some more later, but essentially what he says is that a well-told story makes a huge difference if you want people to follow you. And you can see on this next slide, um, you know, what is a compelling story? We often have um, a, a list of measurable objectives, people sitting around a table and agreeing a strategy, but it isn't going to get true engagement unless there is a strong sense of shared purpose. So Martin Luther King, uh, in August 1958, he started out by giving his written speech, presented it like a typical politician, and it was blisteringly hot and the crowds began to lose interest, and they left, until one of his aides tugged his jacket and said, tell them about your dream, Martin, tell them about your dream. And that is the speech that we all now know about. And Gans maintains that when we only speak from the head, like many politicians do, we don't connect with a listener at an emotional level. And in fact, he did the analysis of the Trump and Clinton election. And although Trump, uh, the Trump victory wasn't expected, um, Marshall Gans maintains that he won because unlike Hillary, he didn't speak like a normal politician. He was able to engage some groups of people in a more meaningful way. And whilst, you know, I'm absolutely not a Trump fan, that sort of logic does make sense. Um, and so what, what we can see here is that 
in short, what we're saying is creating a shared purpose can create the required energy for contagious commitment. And storytelling has been a powerful way of spreading messages for centuries. So there are some key elements, um, key components to storytelling. So for example, um, when we hear our colleagues like David Unwin and Campbell Murdoch and Gail Jerry and Kazar all sharing their successful stories and case studies, we can see the power and using their photographs and charts and graphs helps to bring this to life. They've managed to incorporate all of these elements to create light bulb moments for the listener. So Gann suggests that we need to consider these three areas uh, when we're thinking about leading change. Effectively, we're talking about head, heart and hand with all three being required. And this is the framework that Gans uses. And basically, he weaves together three types of stories into a single narrative, the story of self, the story of us and the story of now. So the story of self is effectively saying, what calls you to do this work? Um, it tells a personal journey and really should capture what Gans calls choice points, the essential experiences that led you to this point in time. And ideally, it's a vivid series of anecdotes that paint a picture of what you believe and how you came to believe it. And then moving around to the story of us, while the first story is about you individually, this story locates you in a collective identity. What does this mean for us as a community? And then the story of now. So what is happening beyond our community that calls us to action? And this third element gives a public narrative a sense of urgency. Public narratives can take many forms, written, oral, multimedia, etc. But what's essential is that they're crafted as stories and that they're shared. So this time doesn't really permit me to do this justice but uh, as an example this is my personal story so about 25 years ago I was a practice nurse manager and I used to run the cholesterol clinic in the days before we had nurse prescribing and so we had to initiate and titrate drugs under the auspices of the crown report and following national guidelines and we had tremendous success in many areas and so despite raised eyebrows in many quarters we set up group consultations and we trained nurses in minor ops and we employed healthcare assistants as the nurses role grew we had to actually create other roles of course those things are now quite normal but at the time it wasn't and in 1999 we went on to win doctor of the year and innovation of the year for our nurse-led care at that time, our practice was held in high regard for providing gold standard care. And even though I moved on to do other things, I spent the next 20 years eating what I thought was a healthy diet, the diet that I had been promoting to my patients all those years ago. So imagine my horror when my cholesterol result in 2019 was 8.5. My father, who had always been slim, fit and healthy, albeit a smoker, uh, had died of a heart attack in his 60s. So I became pretty scared and I reluctantly agreed to go on a statin. At that point, I was working with a lovely colleague and to spare him his blushes, he shall remain nameless. Uh, but he introduced me to the thinking about metabolic syndrome. And suffice to say, I did some research, went on and had a CAC scan and finally had the confidence to come off the statin. Unfortunately, since going low carb and doing intermittent fasting, I've probably gone a bit heavy on the fats and my cholesterol is now 11. But my triglycerides are good. And so I'm learning to accept this. The more research I do, the more I realize the value of this lifestyle. So despite my previously strongly held views of a healthy diet, I've changed my mind, albeit I'm trying not to be too evangelical. And so then as we consider moving around to the story of us, this moves the story and its value from this is me and this is you into this being about us together. It can help people see how they are connected to each other and shared stories create shared identity and challenges and shared experiences. Many of us are part of a community where we exchange thoughts, research and queries in a WhatsApp group. Uh, there's a real sense of community. And one of the shared challenges that we're facing is how to overcome the mindsets of those who commission services and those who write national policy. The story of now helps us to consider why is it necessary? Why is it urgent at this moment in time? It's about motivating people into action, telling the story of the world as it is now and how it could be. 
it creates a sense of urgency and an opportunity to say, let's take action together. What will happen if action isn't taken? What will the future look like if we do this? What's the dream? It should also offer hope because hope can help overcome fear. We've heard David Unwin talk about that in the past. It really does help to have data and research to support your story. So, for example, in the current pandemic, we know that there's a clear link between obesity and impaired immunity. Even Boris is advocating low carb. So avoiding becoming ill with COVID potentially becomes our biggest system driver. Indeed, perhaps the biggest vaccine we can give ourselves is our ability to optimise our metabolic health. We've already seen how colleagues are creating a call to action. Um, this collaboration, uh, this conference, for example, how many of us are actually inviting friends and colleagues to join in various low carb groups or read certain books and watch videos and to start doing their own research using the current free CGM trials is actually enabling micro, micro research at an individual level. We're doing small tests of change, what we call PDSA cycles, uh, to see which foods can actually cause a sugar spike. And for me, that's been absolutely fascinating. Um, there's a brilliant example um, on, the, on the internet. If you would like to have a look at it, I really encourage you. But this is effectively um, James Croft. Time doesn't permit me to show it to you now. It is rather harrowing, but it really is a brilliant example of a compelling narrative. He manages to hook the listener into his story. And you'll see how he uses all three elements um, that I've described to galvanize others into action and to help to want to change things. So if you if you can find that is the James Croft video and I can always share the link if necessary. So I hope you found the GANS framework helpful, but it doesn't tell the whole story. In a nutshell, what this slide says is that what a leader cares about and typically bases at least 80 percent of their message on doesn't connect with roughly 80 percent of people's primary motivators for supporting the change. So. What it means is that we have to be able to tell five stories at once. And so we all have a preference for why something matters to us. Um, even when we're talking to an audience, we need to be able to frame our story so that it appeals to all five sources of meaning at once. But basically, equal parts of your audience are likely to be motivated by what's in it for them, what's in it for their team, what's in it for the patient, or what's in it for their organization or society in general. And just to make uh, bring this to life a little bit, for example, some people will be most motivated by our patients living longer and healthier lives. Others might be more interested in the world looking for a healthier immune system or our commissioners seeking best value care, reducing the burden of disease within finite resources. Or perhaps our team pulling together to create this social movement and have a real feel good factor. At an individual level, it may be that we're really learning uh, so that we can make a difference or even carve out a name for ourselves. And so it goes on. So you can see how it's important to be able to frame the five messages in one. And this is a template that I often use when I'm working with teams to help them think about what is the bigger impact and how are they going to, how are they going to frame their messages. This is, um, uh, again, I haven't got time to show you the whole video, but I would encourage you to have a look at it later on. This is the Oprah Winfrey Black Eye Please flash mob. Um, do have a look online. It's a bit of fun. And if you're a Black Eyed Peas fan, you'll absolutely love it. Uh, it's also quite powerful, though. And there are some lessons for us as to how we can start a social movement. In short, this film was um, this was done in 2009 and it was for Oprah's 24th season launch party in Chicago. It was arranged as a surprise for Oprah and it involved a crowd of about 21,000 people lining the streets of Chicago and dancing in unison. And whilst when you look at it, you'll think that all looks a bit impromptu, it was incredibly well planned. There were 20 professional dancers who each trained 40 fans so that 800 people knew the dance routine in advance. And the key was that they were strategically placed throughout the crowd. They, they, the, those around them only had to copy them to join in the fun. So why am I sharing this with you now? Well, it's a great example of how to create and plan a social movement. And as the NHS is the world's third largest employer, those of us who work for the NHS are well placed to spread the word, metaphorically ensuring we all know the dance moves and are prepared to teach them to others. 
And uh, this is a, a bit of fun, this slide again, in a similar vein, we can all be those role models, especially as we know that the power of a social movement comes from the people within it. When a movement first begins, everyone is disconnected from each other. They need to become linked together. And that happens through developing relationships, sharing best practice, seeking help and connecting with those who know the dance moves, teaching others effectively. So Ruth and Gail, who some of you might know, have been really helpful in creating that movement in their recent series of webinars. And each time we invite our wider network to join these, we're effectively taking collective action to create our own flash mob, or at least a community of practice. Um, I'm sure most of you will have seen this slide, and basically it shows the diffusion of innovation uh, that Rogers created many, many years ago now. And it really does feel at the moment as though we're at a tipping point uh, in the low carb movement. However, contrary to Malcolm Bladwell's assertion in his book, The Tipping Point, whilst influence leaders are important, they're not enough. New research shows that social contagions depend less on the persuasiveness of early adopters and more on how receptive the society is to the idea. To start a social epidemic is not just a matter of finding the experts and connectors to do the infecting. It's more about developing the virus that society is a fertile spreading ground for. So coming back to the influence model, those leading change should pay equal attention to the all four conditions for change, a compelling story, role modeling, appropriate reinforcement systems, and having the skills required for change. Having said that, I realize I've given you lots to think about, but I think it's worth adding that, that it's vital to have that 30 second story to tell as well. When you meet that commissioner or policymaker in the lift, you won't be able to think about having everything at your disposal immediately. So you need to be thinking, what's my 30 second compelling narrative, my 30 second elevator pitch. And I'd like to leave you with this quote by Tom Kelly, who was the CEO at IDEO. And basically, this is about having the confidence to do things differently. Uh, Dick Fosbury was jeered out of the stadium when he first did the Fosbury flop. Even his coach was initially reluctant to continue to work with him. How wrong they were. Until something better comes along, this method is now the high jump gold standard. So my final message is about resilience and hope. What seems abnormal to many will hopefully become the new normal. And we are so fortunate to have so many pioneers and ambassadors for this change in our community. I really hope that some of this has been of help to you. And if you're still listening, thank you.